Thank you. Thank you very much, to Professor Johan Rockström, for your valuable reflections and also for bringing a small window of our hope by bringing carefully positivity despite the low expectations prior to the conference. And I can not only agree more with you and also confirm what you just shared, that the stakeholders that are here and that are also here in the Swedish pavilion and of course also in the German pavilion, which is right next to us here at COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh, they are calling for actions. They're calling for raised ambitions and they're calling for implementation and better preconditions so that we can scale and accelerate the innovative solutions that we have in place in for other countries where they are needed and demanded. And also the companies that are participating here with us in the Swedish pavilion and that are here at COP27, they are on board, as you mentioned, Johan Rekström, and they are backing up the negotiations and aware of that the time is now and that the race is on, and they are ready to collaborate with others, such as the stakeholders in Germany, to together make the green transition the greatest collab in human history. And this is what we've been doing for the last two weeks here at COP27, where we've been bringing some of the most front-running companies and stakeholders from public and private sector, academia and civil society to together showcase and discuss best practice examples in the areas of finance and policy and innovations that is needed to accelerate the green transition and to achieve the Paris Agreement. So thank you very much, Johan Rackström, for your valuable reflections and contribution. And also, of course, thank you so much for participating throughout these two weeks in our events and important meetings. With that, I would like, of course, to welcome our distinguished delegates uh, in, in Berlin. And I'm really happy, as I mentioned, that we've had the pleasure to have the German pavilion right next to us. And my name is Emma Maria Wilking, and I'm head of sustainability at Business Sweden. And it's my absolute pleasure today to moderate this session on transition uh, to a green and circular economy. And with me here in Sharm el Sheikh, um, it, I have a distinguished panel with some pioneering companies. And I would like to first of all introduce you to Johan, Jan Sverd, who is the CEO of Easy Mining, which is an innovative company specialized in closing the nutrient cycles and, and also driving the new and circular material flows in a more efficient commercial way. I would also like to welcome Gilles Tesseron, who is the Vice President uh, for Climate and Biodiversity at Tetra Pak. And Tetra Pak is a world leading company with solutions for processing and packaging and also distribu distribution of, of food products. Welcome. Last but not least, I have Pia Berglund, who is um, Director for Public Affairs at Einride, which is the Swedish mobility company that has not only pioneered the digital and the electric mobility, but also the autonomous movements of goods. Welcome to you as well. And Pia, you revolutionized the world a few years ago when you launched the first electric and automatic autonomous um, vehicle on public roads. And also, quite recently, you entered the German market as the first market in Europe outside of Sweden. And tell me, what motivated that decision and why is the German-Swedish collaboration intriguing to you? Thank you, thank you Emma, and thank you for having us here. And of course, German, the most evident is, of course, Germany is being the biggest market in Europe. Of, of course, that is of big interest to us. But when we started our journey only six years ago, transforming the logistics sector, we started with some really brave companies. And these companies, of course, is also have Germany as their home base, many of them. So, of course, we want to go with our customers where they are. I would say the third uh, reason is, of course, that for us, y you often say, go to America. If you make it in America, you can make it anywhere. That will for the uh, uh, automotive industry in Europe be Germany, of course. That's the home of the car, of, of the trucks. So of course, that's an honor for us to come there and try to, to really influence and transform that market together with Germany, the German authorities and the German, German government, as well as with our customers. Ahead. If we look ahead, we, um, Sweden next year will be the, um, hold the presidency of the Council of the EU. And Sweden will, of course, push a lot and drive the, the green transition agenda, which is also a priority for Germany, of course. And um, could you just elaborate a little bit what Einride possibly could, could support Germany in their green transition and also reach their climate targets and NDCs? So, as I said, when we started six years ago, and we have 
gone to Germany with customers, we have, just during this last year, I would say, of course, with the Ukraine crisis, um, found that the, the solutions we offer actually can you know, reduce emissions here now, 2022. I would say that governments have a bigger interest today in that question. It's not just a customer question. Uh, we can, you know, by using data to make transportation sector much, much, much more energy efficient, actually say that. So I would say the interest for us in Germany from the government has increased. We are going to deploy uh, charger systems around for heavy duty vehicles around Germany. And of course, we are liaising heavily with the government, but as well as actually being, they're very, uh, you know, they really like to invite us as being partners and discuss with them, influence uh, subsidy systems, regulation for autonomous. They've been very, very welcoming to us as a company. And, uh, and for that, of course, we would like to thank the German government. And, and it's, so we, it's, it's been very welcoming. So I would like to express that as well. They're really pushing also EU ahead, I would say, uh, when it comes to challenging some of the old legislation, state aid guidelines. So uh, we like that. <laughs> Indeed we do. Thank you for that. I will go back to you with more questions within shortly. But first I would like to, to turn to you, Gilles, at Tetra Pak. Tell me, how are you contributing to, to circularity and what kind of future opportunities do you see to accelerate this agenda? Thank you. Um, when you think of Tetra Pak, I think many people uh, know our company because of the packaging, but today I will not talk about packaging only. I actually want to explain what we do because we have a clear positioning within the food systems. We deliver equipment that manage to process these uh, oats into uh, milk, as I've seen with the Oatly product there. We transform ice cream, uh, even foie gras and cheese, right? So we have a responsibility within the food systems and the way we are looking into circularity is not only about to think about the end of the package, it's really about coming back to the philosophy behind circular economy. And if you think about it, circular economy is about the efficient use of resources. So the lowest use of materials you can have, which is what we think about when we design new package. It's about the lowest use of consumables. So when our customers, thinking the German customers like DMK, Imer Goods, what we deliver is low water usage, low energy uh, machine, so that we can bring the highest uh, efficiency. So one concrete example is that we are right now pushing on the market a solution where our customers in the dairy world, in the juice world, plant-based world, can reuse 99% of the water they usually use in their process. So that's a way to, 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 to reduce uh, the use of, uh, of uh, um, raw materials, right? Um, and we push forward that philosophy around circularity also when it comes to ingredients. So we are working with Swedish startups, Swiss startups, Israeli startups to really rethink how we can use food ingredient waste into new raw materials that you can use in food, that you can use in cosmetics. So really the idea that we are pushing forward when we think about circular economy at Tetra Pak is reducing as much as possible the use of new materials and providing as many cycles uh, as, as possible. So that's the footprint that we're uh, aiming uh, to have uh, right now on the market. And having that mindset is challenging. It's a new way of thinking uh, the business. But what matters is that it brings value across the whole value chain. And circular economy equals business growth, equals sustainability uh, uh, improvement all across, starting with climate. Thank you, Gilles. And also what Pia alluded to, that. Germany is really pushing the circular agenda and we have been talking a lot about innovation and of course um, finance and of course policies needed to scale the, the green transition and the circular transition and, and agenda. And what do you think is, re is required to create a more enabling policy environment to continue to scale the circular innovation, some of them you just, you just mentioned? Um, and, and I think uh, when we listen to what is happening right now at the COP, obviously there's lots of discussion around climate per se, right? Um, but if we look at all the pavilions that are around us, there's the food system pavilion here, there's the water pavilion there, so we start to see that there's 
But climate change is not about climate only, right? It's about sustainability overall. It's, it impacts people. So what we are pushing at Tetra Pak is really pushing policymakers to integrate within the policy, within the uh, NDCs, uh, key criteria around the reporting, the measurement of food waste, of uh, deforestation. So we need to have an encompassing holistic view of sustainability within the uh, mandatory disclosing and, and, and reporting that will apply to big companies like uh, us and, and certainly the smaller, young, scale-up startups of, of the world because disclosing reporting is the best starting way to take actions. So our call to the policymaker is go beyond climate when it comes to the NDC. Thank you so much, Gilles. I would like to hand over to you, Jean. And Germany is a very important market to you. And I wonder in what way Germany has taken the lead in the circular economy within your field? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So easy mining is uh, doing what Mr. Rockstrom says is the ex two products that are exceeding the planetary boundaries. One is phosphorus and the other one is nitrogen. And we work with both of those. Uh, and Germany has done a really good thing to move on. In 2017, there was a law installed in Germany that you have to recover phosphorus. By in, but of course, they gave it to 2029, so quite a long time. Uh, uh, but that, of course, triggered us to say that, okay, this is our first market to go in with a phosphorus solution. And we found a partner in Germany, is a big utility called Gelsenwasser, and we work very close with them to build a plant in Skopau, north of, uh, at the south of Berlin. Fantastic. Can you tell us a little bit more about that collaboration and other partnerships that you have in Germany? Absolutely. So, so and this is phosphorus, and, and you know, phosphorus is a really important raw material for agriculture. If you don't use it, then uh, you know plants and harvests will go down in production with 50 percent or so and the problem of course in germany that they realized in 17 already that they are importing 55 percent of this from Ger from from russia and uh, europe only has 10 percent of its need produced in europe and that's in one mine in finland rest is then important from the rest of the world so um, this is of course Good that they started early and gave it a long time. Uh, so, so very important issue. The other one I want to mention is uh, nitrogen, which is a new solution for us. We have it in a demonstration plant in, in Denmark, but I think this is a perfect fit also for the German market. It is, uh, you know, nitrogen is produced with uh, gas and air as raw material, so it's extremely uh, carbon dioxide e uh, uh, intensive. And... Um, also, when you use it in wastewater treatment plants, it emits laughing gas or nitrous oxide, which is even more potent as a, a greenhouse gas. So, you know, researchers say this is about 7% of the whole greenhouse gas uh, emissions uh, globally. So it's a big effort, and we have something that is uh, going to commercialization next year. So. Uh, we are looking for further partners in Germany, of course, which we think is going to be an, an important market, bo both in engineering and in uh, plants. Fantastic. And it, it's clear that the innovations that, you, uh, that you're describing is truly needed, and, and you see several opportunities, not least in Germany, to contribute to their circular agenda. But do you see any, any challenges or any concerns? Yeah. Yes. So, so the issue is, of course, Germany has taken this, so sticks and you know, carrots is needed for innovations. I think that is, uh, somebody says you need to, to marry the uh, negotiations with the innovations a bit. Uh, that would be a great thing for COP going forward. Uh, but, you know, for example, our phosphorus product, that is the cleanest product that you can do, much cleaner than the ones that come from Russian mines, much cleaner than the things that come from Morocco. It's not allowed to use where it is best, like in animal feed and so on. And this is a legislation that was based on a linear system and, of course, from the 80s. Um, so legislators need to think, you know, a, a whole legislation is built on that you should be linear. And legislation needs to be rebuilt to make it circular. Indeed. And unfortunately, we are re actually closing 
to our ending on this panel, but also actually on uh, the negotiations taking place here at COP27. And, and Pia, you and your colleagues at Einreid, you've been here for the, lo for the two weeks that the COP conference has been going on. And, and you've been following, of course, the no negotiations closely, and you're also participating in a number of panels and, and meetings throughout these two weeks. Is there anything that stood out for, for Einreid during these weeks? Uh, so I would like to touch on two points and of course I think the most obvious one because people sometimes question why you fly into these kind of conferences. You have an obligation to listen and I think Mr. Rockstrom explained that very well that we also taken the opportunity to meet with the civil society, we met with the UN women, so I think that's an obligation you have to those people actually suffering from climate uh, crisis. The second one I would like also like to pick up from his uh, introduction is that uh, someone said in the panel, uh, there's an inflation in, in net zero promises, accountability and delivery. And, and for companies like Enri that has primary data and, and work with a digital product, that is actually what we're offering our customers. It's time to take, hold us responsible, hold us accountable. And customers, investors, governments, NGOs, we need to show on the table what we're delivering. It's, it's no more talking, now it's time to do. Thank you, Pilar. And Gilles, what are your reflections from, from the conference? Um, I would like to build on what Pia just said. I think, I think accountability is key. So if we go back in time, we've indeed seen this inflation of uh, net zero ambitions and 1.5 uh, degree uh, plan from companies, but also from states, right? Um, but I think everybody realizes that uh, now it's time to actions because when we look at the ambition versus the investment plan, we are not there. So um, I think that is something that we have kept on uh, hearing. Now, if I take a step back and I think about um, um, Tetra Back and again our, our business field, which is food system, I must say that I was glad to see um, how important the topic of food has been put on the table during that, uh, that COP27. Uh, so there's not only three, four pavilion uh, about that one, but I think we all have realized the uh, impact of food system, which is one fourth of the uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. It's a highly dysfunctional industry because one third of the food is wasted or lost at a time where many people suffer from malnutrition. Um, so if we manage to fix the food systems, we will reduce a lot the greenhouse gas emissions. At the same time, we will have a positive impact on, on, uh, on the communities because that's also one of the key thematic that we've heard here. Climate change is not about climate. Climate is about people, communities and businesses. The last takeaway that I want to, uh, to, uh, to put forward here is also that we have heard a lot about how nature and nature-based solutions can be part of the solutions. Um, because forest um, is actually the best natural way to uh, capture carbon. We need to protect them, we need to restore them. And that's part of the theme that we have seen and that is being pushed by the country. So the deforestation pledge that many countries took last year, there has been um, a revival of that pledge from the 12 billion that were announced last year, already close to 3 billion uh, euros have been spent on, on, on the protection of the forest. And I think this is very key. So I started by talking about actions. Well, we start to see actions also on the side of biodiversity and nature, which I think is very critical. Thank you. Jan, what are your reflections from the conference? Uh, so, so I have also two of them. <laughs> One, of course, which is kind of interesting for me, there's been a few times on this. I see the Americans are really on this time. This is a huge difference compared to two years ago. They are around everywhere and challenging everybody to do at least as much as they do. So that's a new new thing, at least for me. And I think that will help the course a lot. If they are not on, it's not going to happen, uh, my view. Then the other thing is, uh, of course, we, we are here, and this position we have in this pavilion is quite good because we have Germany next door, as you mentioned. On that side, we have a food pavilion. And on that side, over there, there is a water pavilion. So I think the understanding that you know, it's not just about energy, energy production, w which is very important, but, uh, you know, it's as much about production of products, and it's about recycling, and that uh, this agriculture, food, water, you know, and nutrients is really there, and I hope it's even going to grow to the next COP. 
Thank you for those reflections. And uh, if I understand you right here, you are sharing a little bit what Rockstar also say, said in initially, that he's carefully positive from this conference. And your, the reflections are, are truly interesting and inspiring. But if through, I mean, throughout these now last hours of no negotiations and of this conference, what will be your key messaging and also that you would like this negotiators to, to think about? And also, what would you like the last hours of negotiations to focus on really shortly? We'll start with you, Jan. Yeah, it's, of course, very hard because we don't know what the documents look like now at all. <laughs> so, but I think uh, deliverables from Glasgow to now, I think that would be very important. And also this expanding role of uh, climate gas reductions that is not just about energy production. Thank you. Gilles. Um, well, it's, I, th I think you, you said it all, so I think it's, it's about de delivering. Um, my message to, uh, to uh, the policymaker, to the negotiator, is that they, they can count on many companies, starting that by the ones that are presented at Business Sweden, and I'm sure that are uh, in, the, in the German uh, uh, panel. So we are here to enable the transition. What we need is clear guidance. We need actually the legislation to make it happen so that we can all accelerate. Uh, so you can count on businesses to go to the 1.5 max, to go to net zero. That's my message. Thank you. And last words from you, Pilar. Thank, uh, thank you. And of course, we also touch upon that in introduction. It's, it's the funding of, of those that have a longer way to work. And I think that's we have to to find a way of solving. It's easy to say we're in a country like Sweden, we can't afford it. I mean, for, for real. I mean, let's, let's get this together because everybody's a winner here. Gender, uh, poverty, the planet. I mean, there's no losers. So, I mean, I would act governments, just do it. Just take out the wallet and do it because we have to do it. It's like there's no other answer then just do it actually thank you so I'm much i'm a There's bit angry <laughs> no it's great no other answers and no other options and on that note i would like to conclude this session thank you so much for these pioneering companies to participating today thank you pilla berglund the public affairs director at enride thank you gilles tesseron the vice president of climate diversity on petra Park. and thank you jan svard ceo of easy mining thank you of course everyone in Berlin tuning into this and thank you everyone participating in the pavilion here today and also thank you for the participants joining us from the German pavilion sitting here in the pavilion as well. So with that, thank you so much for participating. Thank you so much for these inspiring words and let's now together pioneer the possible. Over, you, over to you, Lisa, in Berlin.